<clears throat> Before I start, I want to thank Warren, not only for his unconditional support and his general response, generous response to my many, many questions, but for sharing with me his political experience, his, his Trotskyism, his involvement in the workers' power, in solidarity, in justice for janitors, and, he, and in his recent support for Palestine. For introducing to me such revolutionary figures as Ernest Mandel, uh, Mike Davis, Hugo Blanco, among a hundred many others, without whom it was impossible to understand his theory. I was extremely lucky to know Warren and his works in one of the most critical historical moments in Iran, which was characterized by mass struggles. And he never let me fall into despair in the face of repressions. Rather, he urged me to write, to offer a concrete analysis of the concrete situation so as to prepare myself for the next wave of the mass revolts. Warren put into practice what he told me in correspondence, a communist is never alone. He, with his indescribable patience, listened to my descriptions of what was happening in Iran. He armed me with concepts and notions so I could position myself against the reactionaries. The most important lesson I learned from Warren was to learn from the masses. What I'm going to present now is not a theoretical intervention, but I'm going to, but I'm trying to explain what concepts became important to me while I was involved in a mass protest movement recently sparked in Iran. Uh, Althusser and his contemporaries uh, was written in a certain theoretical historical conjuncture that allowed through a struggle, a dismantling of the dominant readings of Althusser. The book is certainly not a closed or finished totality, but rather continues to produce new effects with the encounters specific to different historical and political conjunctures. I want to examine the effects it produced and the questions whose formulation it made possible in the context of the mass protest in Iran in 2022-23. Perhaps no one has contributed more to the conceptualization of the materiality of ideology in its concrete sense than Warren. His reading of Althusser's theory of the materiality of ideology places a struggle and antagonism at its heart. By linking the notion of ideology with the territory of the bodies rather than the interior realm of consciousness. Changing the distribution of the visible and the invisible in Althusser's writings, he helps us understand ideology in relation to the corporeal and spatial dispositions rather than the interiority of minds and consciousness. I intend to limit my discussion to what Warren describes as the fragility of the ISAs that are, and I quote, capable of producing not only subjections, which for Althusser is also always a process of individualization, but byproducts of collectivity, the composition of forces and revolt, end of quote. However, as Warren argues, Althusser does not tell us how such byproducts come into existence. I want to suggest that Michel Peshu fills in this absence through the notion of ideology as a paradoxical space, which is itself a development of the notion of the materiality of ideology beyond the boundaries of Althusser's thought. According to Peshu, and I quote, ideology does not comprise a stronghold, but a paradoxical space, and one could conquer and occupy various strongholds penetrating them and redirecting them to ends diametrically opposed to those it was designed to fulfill. I'm not going to discuss the fragility of the ISAs from a purely theoretical perspective, but by examining the concrete political questions arising from the experience of the mass protests in Iran beginning in September 2022, I want to explain the tactical reversibility of the ISAs, 
that makes it possible to take advantage of the cracks and openings occurring in them. Obviously, in the only internationally recognized theocratic state in the world, that is the Islamic Republic of Iran, religious institutions and the rituals proper to them are seen as the main ideological instrument used by the ruling class to fabricate beautiful lies, to deceive the masses, and to produce subjection and obedience. However, the fact of the revolt and resistance sparked by the killing of Gina Amini by the regime's morality police made it possible to move beyond the territory of the obvious and to challenge the obviousness of the obvious in its entirety. The estates the struggle to reappropriate and reorganize certain spaces, particularly the cemeteries and mosques that were used as the main sites of revolt during the mass protest movement, demonstrated that ideology had more to do with the disposition of our bodies and its spatial arrangements rather than our minds and ideas. Further, as the most important sites of religious practice in one of the key ideological state apparatuses, they were transformed into a space of confrontation between the mass movement and the regime, the homogeneity of the ISAs was radically challenged. The ISAs were no longer conceived as a unified bloc under the control of the ruling class, whose function was the reproduction of the existing power relations, but rather as contributing to the emergence of a new relation of forces that threatened the stability of the state. The recent protests in Iran started in the Aichi Cemetery in Saqqez in Kurdistan province, where a large crowd had gathered around Gina's gravestone, on which someone wrote in Kurdish, Dear Gina, you will not die. Your name will become the symbol of resistance. This anticipation was not a product of divine inspiration but derived from the power imminent in the disposition of the bodies of the masses whose collective force had overcome all the measures taken by the security forces to prevent their gatherings in the cemetery. The words written on the gravestone were materialized in more than six months of ongoing mass struggle, which threatened to shatter the regimes of politics and thought. The bodies of the dead and the cemeteries in which they were buried had become the main sites of a struggle between the people and the state repressive apparatus. The state exerted power not simply over the living human beings, but over the bodies of the dead and the space of the cemeteries to minimize the possibility of disorder arising from the anger of the mourners. The protesters were shot dead by the police to weaken and frighten the mass movements, and sometimes to reduce the numbers of the bodies in a struggle. However, they were no longer simply dead matter to be buried and allowed to decompose, but became markers of the battleground on which new relations of force were established and a combat waged between the regime and the masses. Often, these dead bodies were hidden by the people in secret places, in mosques or the homes of distant relatives to make sure the police could not seize them. The burial ceremonies in the cemeteries often turned into huge protests as large crowds gathered there, listened to the speeches made by the parents of the martyrs, mostly women endowed with unprecedented power who openly denounced the regime and its oppression. This spirit of opposition was immediately transmitted to the crowd of mourners 
who would begin to chant against the regime and march into the streets where more people joined them. The uninterrupted succession of funerals that followed the regime's use of deadly force made it impossible for that same regime to quell the uprising. The regime, as might be expected, developed strategies to control the movements of the crowds gathering in the cemeteries, which are normally open spaces designed to give easy access to people who wish to mourn at the graveside. The police confiscated the dead bodies, refused to deliver them to their families, and after several days, would bury them in remote areas in the middle of the night without informing the families. In one case, the Bakhtiari people in Khuzestan exhumed the corpse and carried it to a nearby cemetery, which then turned into the scene of protest and uproar. In several cases, the space of the cemeteries were enclosed by walls intended to prevent the uncontrolled gathering of large crowds and to allow the police to monitor the comings and goings of the mourners. Further, the same spaces could be divided in, into a smaller areas, separating and isolating the grades of protesters from the rest to prevent other groups of mourners from being drawn into the mobilizations that often occurred around the burials of protesters. In some cases, graves were defaced, broken, or destroyed by agents of the regime. On the 40th day after Gina's killing, when people were supposed to gather in the cemetery, according to the prescribed religious rituals, the police opened up a dam, flooding the route to the cemetery to prevent the crowd from entering the place. In addition, cameras were installed to allow police to identify the protesters, and a number of people were arrested and jailed for their participation in protesters' funerals. Other techniques of surveillance and control were employed to count the number of the people who went in or out and determine the time of the individual's arrival and departure from the cemetery, allowing the police to prevent entry when a certain number of mourners was recorded. In the case of the mosques, where large numbers of people congregated for Friday prayers, especially in Kurdistan and Baluchistan, where Sunni courts and Sunni Baluch reside, a space again became a matter of political struggle. These mosques, mosques were not simply apparatuses of social control where sermons emphasized obedience to the state. On the contrary, the government of the Islamic Republic worried that the mosque too easily functioned as a place where the people's discontent often blossomed into revolt. In Kurdistan province, revolutionary songs were played from the same loudest speakers through which the call for prayer is broadcast, encouraging the masses to join the ongoing protest. The clergy, in solidarity with the demonstrators, devoted their sermons to political questions and expressed their opposition to the regime. The space of the mosque was also used to provide medical treatment to the injured and to hide dead bodies from the police. But it was the Maki Mosque in Baluchistan that most exemplified its role in the mobilization of the masses. It is important to note that gathering for Friday prayer in the mosque is an important religious practice in Iran, both for the Shiites and the Sunni population, and represents the largest religious gathering for the Baluch Sunnis in the city of Zahedan. Both in the Islamic Republic of Iran, which officially recognizes 
12 Imam Shiism and the Farsi language, and in the Shah's secular regime, the religion, language, dress, and customs of the religious and national minorities that include Kurds, Azeris, Kashkais, Turkaman, Baluch, Bakhtiari, Arab, among many others, have faced constant coercion and oppression. This includes geographic changes through redrawing the provincial boundaries, forced displacement of the minority population, renaming cities and towns, imposing Farsi names on the, pop on the minority population, and banning the use of the minority languages in a schools and government offices. The Maki Mosque in Baluchistan mentioned earlier is the largest Sunni mosque in Iran and holds up to 50,000 people. Because it can accommodate large crowds, one person holding up a sign or talking about social justice can start a large scale mobilization. Since the last year's uprising, the, the Maki Mosque has become the main center of mobilization and revolt. This space gives people the freedom to congregate, hold up signs, have discussions before and after prayers, and constitute the, the base of a mass action before they go out to the street. One of the demands expressed by the Sunni worshippers of the Maki Mosque, both in their signs and as slogans, is the right to national self-determination, a right which was shortly exercised in the framework, in the framework of mass-based shoras, that, that is councils, in the early months of the 1979 revolution before they were brutally repressed by the regime. As a consequence, the regime has come to regard the Maki Mosque with a mixture of terror and fear, as a space where profanities and blasphemies come out of the mouth of believers, as Peshu says. And the, the regime has struggled to overcome the evil of resistance, not through changing the law or controlling the people's beliefs, but through controlling the movement of their bodies. This includes a wide range of material strategies and practices, controlling the time worshippers go in and out, blocking the road to the mosque, and uh, it's ironic that it is under an Islamic Republic, forcing worshippers to take different routes, uh, setting up tents near the mosque and searching the bodies of the mosque squares as a strategy for isolating them, and preventing them from forming the mass base of the protest, installing cam cameras to identify their faces, and restructuring their space around the mosque in a way that disperses the population. What we learn from the real practice of the masses is that the ISAs don't render resistance impossible, but have, as Warren says, and I quote, the capacity under specific circumstances to produce effects other than and opposed to those they were designed for, end of quote. By reappropriating the collectivizing tendencies that are the byproducts of disciplinary and individualizing regimes. The ISAs are inserted in a complex process of subordination and domination, identification and counter-identification, that depending on the historical conjuncture can undergo sudden reversal that bear the traits of the conflicts that constitute the specific conjuncture. Althusser's theory of the materiality of ideology as conceptualized by Warren and in its con conjunction with the shoes ideas, disrupts the established conception of the ISAs as simply reproducing the relations of power. Instead, it provides a conception 
of the unevenness and conflictuality proper to the ISAs, each of which always already contains the tendentially transformational or ruptural element capable of overturning the existing relations of power during critical historical moments. As Tishu maintains, and I quote, dominated ideologies are formed nowhere else than in the very location of domination, in it and against it, through the flaws and stumbling blocks that unavoidably affect it. Even when domination extends to the point that one cannot help it because that's how it is, the it and the that remain and will return in an unpredictable form in the failures of interpolation. Thus, there is no place or a space external to the ISAs from which to act against it. Instead, we may speak of a fracture or a rupture that occurs within the ISAs when the spatial dispositions of the bodies ceases to be organized in the way the disciplinary regime requires. In Iran, the regime struggles to neutralize the effects of counter power that spring from these paradoxical spaces of mass revolt and a spontaneous organization by attempting to restructure the disposition of bodies and spaces. It works constantly to strengthen its defenses at its weak points, flaws, and fractures, and undertakes incessant modification to occupy these points preventively or to reappropriate them. As Althusser says, and I quote, the combat for the reproduction of the dominant ideology is a combat that is never over. It has to be taken up again and again and always under the law of the class struggle. Just as for Althusser, the May 1968 events brought to light the element of resistance and a struggle in the ISAs, particularly the schools, the mass uprising of the 2022 in Iran showed the unevenness and the fragility of the ISAs inscribed in a historical conjuncture whose fluctuations determined them to work differently than before. The ISAs are a perpetual battleground without a stability or the capacity to reproduce the existing relations of force. New antagonistic tendencies may make the renewal and reproduction of ideological elements dependent on the outcome of a series of struggles a matter of contradiction and a struggle rather than simple repetition. This is most visible in the materiality and diversity of religious places and performances that undermine the dominant ideology. The religious discourse and the and practices, practice of the masses have always been sites of a struggle and resistance and while rulers have attempted to confiscate and overcome the existing contradiction between various parties and factions through them, they have never managed to do so completely, as the case of the Maki Mosque and the cemeteries show. Warren teaches us that mass movements are able to bring certain ideas to life and enable us to refute or fight against the ideas which are founded on the fear of the movements themselves. His writings are like a weapon in our hands to contest any conceptualization of power and right in its juridical sense. Because what we are witnessing now is the actual power of the masses, which changes the re relations of forces and its equilibrium. Therefore, any sort of policy which attempts to contain the right or the power of the masses under legal terms and in constitutions or declarations without in fact granting or endorsing the actual or organs of power 
formed by the masses, workers, minorities, is simply an illusion. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lale. Thank you. That was great. Um, Paniotis, uh, whenever you'd like to start. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, many thanks. Uh, apologies for not being at the beginning of the, let's say, webinar conference. But as I have explained a couple of months ago uh, to Joseph, this was the day of my return from the Historical Materialism Conference in London. So I basically arrived a couple of hours before. Anyway, uh, but again, it's a great honor to be here, uh, to be able to discuss uh, Warren's indispensable contribution uh, on how to understand both, uh, both Althusser, but also uh, philosophy in general. Uh, okay, so uh, I begin. W one of the most widespread criticism of Althusser has been uh, the one referring to his structuralism. And the leitmotif of this critique is well known. It has been suggested that Althusser basically incorporates in Marxism a conception of a structured social reality where abstract structures are dominant, creating an inescapable social grammar and eliminating any space for human agency and praxis. In the words of E.P. Thompson, if there is a Marxism of the contemporary world, which Marx or Engels would have recognized instantly as an idealism, Althusserian structuralism is this. The category has attained to a primacy over its material referent, the conceptual structures hangs above and dominates social being. Similarly, Ted Benton would offer the canonical version of treating Althus Althusser as basically <clears throat> a structuralist. How can Althusser, a self-professed Marxist philosopher, ally with structuralism to the extent of complementing his already effective assault on Marxist positions by the single tacti tactic of denying that these positions were all along Marxist positions? Marxism has been conquered from within by the alien ideologies and so by implication, wep the weaponry now on offer from the structuralists justifies a tactical alliance with them to enable a recapture of Marxism for itself. And one could go on and find many uh, quotes from the, especially from the 70s and early 80s, describing Althusser's supposed structuralism. Now, it's interesting that in, in a certain way, Althusser's own self-criticism seemed to substantiate partly, at least, this critique. Althusser never fully admitted being a structuralist, of course, only that he had flirted with a certain structuralist terminology and vocabulary, and I quote from the elements of self-criticism. It must be admitted that it thus became tempting to flirt, coquetieren, not with the structure and its elements, etc., because all these concepts are in Marx, but, for example, with the notion of the effectivity of an absent cause, which is, it must be said, much more Spinozist than structuralist, in order to account at one at the same time for classical political economist mistakes, for the relations of productions, and even for the fetishism, but I did not do so. The theory of fetishism always seemed to be ideological, and to herald by the term structural causality, something which in, is in fact an immense theoretical discovery of Marx, but which can also in the Marxist tradition be termed dialectical materialist causality. Provided that the critical effects are under, kept under control, these notions are not entirely useless. An example is the notion of the absent cause, but we, are not, we were not always able to restrain ourselves in certain pages of reading capital in that spirit of 1965 and our flirt with structuralist terminology obviously beyond, beyond acceptable limits. Now, uh, of course, we know that uh, this is a, a partial self-criticism. Althusser insists that they were never really uh, structuralist. Because for Althusser, uh, structuralism is no philosopher's philosophy, but a philosophy of philosophical ideology of scientists. That, it seems, are vague are changing, that the binary is very ill-defined, does not mean that its general tendency cannot be characterized as rationalist, mechanistic, and above all, formalist. This is, again, a quote from elements of self-criticism. And in a simple 
in a simple and, and Althusser will uh, continue exactly uh, this uh, idea that the, the main element of structuralism is basic a kind of a formalist idealism the idea of producing the real by a combination combinatory of elements in contrast Althusser insists that Marx does not speak of the combination of elements in the structure of a mode of production but this combination, Verbindung, is not a formal combinatory. We express, expressly pointed that out purposely. In fact, this is where the most import, important demarcation line is drawn. This is how Althusser tries to insist that despite the flirting, they never went into this idea uh, of a combinatory. And uh, Althusser insists that when dealing with structuralism, the, the crucial opposition is not so much between form a process because in his opinion even a Hegelian uh, structuralism a formalism of the process was co co conceivable but rather the, the line of demarcation was the efficacy of class struggle at the heart of theoretical uh, production so the challenge is not simply about putting process over structure but putting contradiction over process and again I quote from Althusser in truth, what we need to look at is the strange status of a decisive concept in Marxist theory, the concept of the tendency, tendential law, law of a tendential process. In the concept of tendency, there appears not only the contradiction internal to the process, Marxism is not a structuralism, not because it affirms the primacy of the process over the structure, but because it affirms the primacy of contradiction over the process. Yet, even this is not enough. But something else, which politically and philosophically it's much more important, the special unique status which makes Marxist science a revolutionary science. Not simply a science which revolutionaries can use in order to make revolution, but a science which they can use because it rests on theoretical class, on revolutionary class theoretical position. So it's very interesting that Althusser at the same time trying to uh, give a much greater emphasis on uh, uh, antagonism, uh, contradiction in, uh, uh, as, the, as the main aspect of any structured uh, social uh, reality, and also uh, Mu incorporates his self-criticism of his partial, supposedly, structuralism with his self-criticism on theoreticism, hence this, how this entire idea of the class, of, of incorporating the notion of class theoretical positions. And it is exactly through this self-criticism about theoreticism that uh, comes the crucial reference to Spinozism, which haunts us ever after. And I quote, if we were never structuralists, we can now explain why why we seem to be, even though we were not, why there came about this strange misunderstanding of the basis of which books were written. We were guilty of an equally powerful and compromising passions. We were Spinozists. Moreover, Althusser points to the possibility that instead of an idealist structural approach, it was possible to envisage both a different Marxist topography and a non-idealist conception of, of the whole. And it's interesting how in this point, uh, something also evident in the uh, in the introduction to the manuscript uh, Sur la Reproduction, uh, Althusser poses particular emphasis on the notion of to of topic of topography, and I and I quote. The conclusion is obvious, the position of the Marxist topography protects the dialectic against the delirious idealist notion of producing its own material substance. It imposes on it, on the contrary, a forced recognition of the material conditions of its own efficacy. These conditions are related to the definition of the sites, the spheres, to their limits, to their mode of determination in the totality of social formations. If it wants to grasp these realities, the materialist dialectic cannot rest satisfied with the residual forms of the Hegelian dialectic. It needs other forms which cannot be found in the Hegelian dialectic. It is here, continues Althusser, that Spinoza served as, as a sometimes direct, sometimes very indirect reference in his effort to grasp a non emitter that is non transcendent, non simply transitive, a la Descartes, nor expressive, a la Leibniz, causality, which would account for the action of the whole on its parts and the parts on the whole, an unbounded whole, which only the active relations in its parts. In this effort, Spinoza served as though indirectly as a first and almost unique guide. Now, it's interesting how uh, and one could it's interesting that well, sometimes we need to have a more uh, 
a more uh, extended discussion on, on, on how the role that the notion of uh, topic, which is a notion, of course, borrowed from the Freudian uh, vocabulary, plays a role uh, in Althusser, especially in that period, end of the 60s, early 70s, which is also coincides with the period of the emergence of the of the vocabulary of the uh, of the of the encounter, it, it's interesting to see how it dominates the introduction to sur la reproduction, but also one can point that it's still a kind of a tendential uh, answer, uh, since uh, especially in sur la reproduction uh, and its kind of supposedly kind of more uh, pedagogic kind of writing. One could even see some elements of, of functionalism until in terms of vocabulary. One might say, on the other hand, that Althusser's real self-criticism is the whole that the, the, the whole conceptual framework of the encounter starts to emerge after 1967 and then in the early 1970s, in the sense that uh, the full rupture that with a conception of, a, of, of the combinatory uh, is exactly this attempt to think of social forms as encounters, adding a strong sense of, of anti-teleology and anti-singularity to the very relationality that the notion of structure pointed to, uh, with the material rituals and apparatuses adding the element of reproduction and, and durability. By this, I want to suggest that especially in, in the second, let's say late 60s, it seems that Althusser tries to think in this, start to incorporate the element of the, uh, the element of the encounter in thinking the relationality of, of, of the structure. So it's an encounter, there's no teleology, there's also no deeper determination. And in place of a more uh, structural, let's say, deeper structural, deep structure kind of determination. Here it is the notion of reproduction as duration uh, that enters the stage uh, through ma rituals, material rituals and apparatus. And I quote from uh, the reproduction, it's easy to see that if a mode of production lasts only as long as, this, as the system of state apparatus that guarantees the conditions of reproduction, reproduction equals duration, of its basis, that is the relations of production, one has to attack the system of the state apparatus and size state power to disrupt the conditions of the reproduction. The reproduction equals duration, equals existence of a mode of production and establish new relations of production. So these are established under the protection of the new state and new state apparatus, which ensure the reproduction equals duration, equals existence of the new relation of production, in other words, the new mode of production. I think there is an instance when Althusser thinks that he can only he can only think of, let's say, relations as uh, or structures as relations that can uh, have duration uh, and existence because they are reproduced. Before, of course, we go uh, even further, as we can see in, in both the unpublished manuscripts of the 1970s and the manuscripts, of course, of the uh, of the 1980s, such as the uh, under. Uh, uh, so the de la raconte, uh, where we we see that everything is taken by by the notion of the encounter and and I quote whence the form if order and the order it brings whose birth is induced by by, by this pile up determined as they are by the structure of the encounter where once the encounter has been affected, but not before the primacy of the structure over its elements. Hence, finally, what one must call an affinity and a complementarity of the elements that come into play into their encounter, their readiness to collide, interlock, in order that this encounter to take hold, that is to take form and last give birth to forms and new forms, just as water takes hold on ice is there waiting for it, etc., etc. We all know, we are all very well acquainted with this uh with this metaphor so this is this seems to be this the, the very let's say contradictory syntax of the structure of the encounter the final let's say exit from structures towards encounter now uh i think this is this this is basically uh one of the possible readings that we can do of Althusser self criticism which partially and in a strange way sort of uh, accepts that 
Althusser, to a certain extent, extent was influenced by structuralism uh, and then sort of through a self-critic moved away from it. That he was a structuralist and not simply a spin -realist. I think that one of the great merits of uh, uh, Warren's book, and now I come to that, is exactly that we can perhaps uh, move beyond taking Althusser's self-criticism as granted. And in this sense, what about revisiting the Althusser of high Althusserianism as a way of thinking that was already beyond structuralism, including the fact that structuralism in that period referred to something much more complex than what we tend to think now. And I think this is one of, of, of the important contribute one of the important contributions of, of Warren's book, the way he offers of, of a much more complex, pro problematized, and nuanced description of both structuralism and Althusser's relationship. Firstly, Montag stresses the complex history of structuralism, including the importance of the influence of phenomenology, something often underestimated. Secondly, he stresses that the schematic opposition between structure and genesis, in fact, pointed to a much more complex articulation of theoretical position. Thirdly, certain aspects of structuralism tended to incorporate a conception of a continuous historical time that had more affinity with a Hegelian conception of time than they wanted to accept. And it's interesting, as uh, Montag reminds us, that it was actually Althusser that uh, in uh, Le Capital that actually pointed to how uh, in, in high structuralism like Le Vistfos, one can find exactly such a Hegelian conception of time, and I quote, the synchronic is contemporaneity itself, the co-presence of the essence with determination, the present being readable as a structure in an essential section, because the present is the very existence of the essential structure. The synchronic therefore presupposes the ideological conceptions of a continuous homogeneous time. It follows that the diachronic is merely the development of this present in the sequence of a temporary continuity in which the events to which history in the strict sense can be reduced, and in parentheses a reference to levi strauss are merely successive, successive contingent presence in the time continuum, like the synchronic, which is the primary concept. The diachronic, therefore, presupposes both of the two very two, of the very two characteristics I have isolated in the Hegelian conception of time and ideological conception of historical time. So it's interesting how we can already find in high Altusserianism a kind of critic of structuralism. And of course, Warren also stresses how it was all the importance of how Derrida already in 1959 uh, attempted to problematize the position between structure and genesis. And I quote from Warren's book, uh, in a very important sense, Derrida's text is an intervention, an attempt from within the problematic of Husserl's phenomenology to call into question the two nominally opposing form in which it was actuated, actualized sorry, in France, on the one hand, a philosophy of consciousness, and on the other, and for a formalism. And as Derrida stressed in Husserl, one already can find a critique of a certain uh, structuralism. And I quote from Derrida, in Husserl's eyes, the structuralism of the Weltanschauung philosophy is a historicism. And despite Derrida's vehement protests, Husserl will persist in thinking like all historicism. And despite its originality, the Welt and Schaung's philosophy avoids neither relatives nor skepticism. But Montag also shows how things were even more complex than that. For example, uh, he reminds us of the importance of uh, Cavalier's critique uh, of the transcendentalism still surviving in the emphasis of phenomenology uh, on, on consciousness in his book, hence the famous uh, quote that uh, it's not a philosophy of consciousness, but a philosophy of the concept that can yield a doctrine of science, the generative necessity is not that of an activity, but of a dialectic. Now, it's interesting also how, how Warren deals with Althusser's critique of Lévi-Strauss, indicating that although Althusser obviously distanced himself from that version of structuralism while acknowledging its importance, he avoided or did not proceed with a kind of symptomatic reading that Derrida actually performed on Levi Strauss. 
Now, there is also another important contribution of, of, of Warren on what constitutes Althusser's actual flirting with structuralism or at least some form of structuralist ideology. And it's also important how Montag stresses that it was Pierre Masseret that actually criticized Althusser for this deviation. By itself, this is a, a, a very important movement moment where the student actually you know, of a true pedagogical relation where it, it is the the student that tells the, the master what is wrong. Uh, Montag shows how Masere actually points to the main problem of Althusser's theorization of the, soul, of the social whole, which was the notion of latent structures and the theatrical metaphors, the dialectical, like Antonat, etc. And he did, we know how Althusser decides to get rid some phrases in the second edition of Lear Le Capital. And this is also a moment to, to remember that uh, Masseret indeed was a critic of structuralism already in his theory of literary production, a kind of deconstruction of la lettre. And I quote from Masseret, the idea of structure which seems to come from linguistics where it is justifiably applied to literary objects is actually used in, in literary analysis in a sense remote from its original one. It goes back to the entirely unscientific hypothesis that the work has an intrinsic meaning, though this does not imply that this meaning is explicit. Paradoxically, this enables it to be read before it has even been written, a beautiful phrase. And in contrast to structuralism, Masseret points to the possibility of a, a high originally, let's say, Historical materialist deconstructionist approach, and I quote, a different approach, a different hypothesis, more fruitful, though hardly ever used, might be offered. The work exists above all by its determinate absences, but what, by what it does not say in its relation to what it is not, not that it can conceal anything. This meaning is not buried in its depths, masked or disguised. It's not a question of hunting him down with interpretation. It is not in the work, but by its sides, on its margins, at that limit where it ceases to be what it claims to be because it has reached back to the very conditions of its possibility. It is then no longer constituted by a factitious necessity, the product of, an, of a cautious or an unconscious intention. Moreover, Masere seems to suggest that in contrast to a certain structure ideology, we can think of a different conflictual relationality. And again, I quote, the disorder that permits the work is related to the disorder of ideology, which cannot be organized as a system. The work derives its form from its incompleteness, which enables us to identify the active presence of a conflict at its borders. In the defect of the work is articulated a new truth. For those who seek to know this truth, it establishes an original relation to the real, it establishes the revealing form of uh, a knowledge. So one could go on with this beautiful text by Masseret, and we can also discuss the kind of influence it, it, it had in later on, on Althusser, for example, how the notion of the mer margin emerges later, but I don't have time. Now, Montag points the way that Masseret criticizes a certain version of a structural interiority in the literary text, which is similar to the way that Althusser, under Masseret's critique and influence, decided to discard any notion of a latent or deeper structures, as thus of any conception of the structure as a social grammar or essence or even worse, hidden truth. So, uh, and I think that through, to conclude, come to the conclusion that does all this mean that we should uh, treat early Althusser as, as a structuralist who then performed a kind of self-criticism and through his self-criticism he moved from structures to encounters and encounters uh, reproduced by material rituals and apparatuses until even a more much more contingent uh, uh, version of the structure of, of, of just contingent con conjectures, as structures, etc., etc., or, or, or chance encounters, I strongly disagree. Uh, and perhaps this is also kind of my uh, own self-criticism was, was in, in my in earlier writings, I have tended to accept uh, Althusser's criticism uh, in its letter. One reason, of course, and I won't go in details, is that as it has many times been uh, commented, 
already in contradiction and over the determination, we have the full development of the thesis that when talking about structure, we're always talking about the structure of a conjecture in its singularity. The other, perhaps, road, the other reason, is the suggestion made more recently and very convincingly by Yorgos Fortunis. I suppose that's the point he developed in his presentation, which unfortunately, as I explained, I could not be here to, uh, to uh, but I have read the book, about the strong uh, relation of Althusser's initial conceptualization of structures and the strongly Spinoza's conception of immanence, with immanence being the limit with any conception of metaphysical dualism, including the one inscribed in the notion of latent structures. Moreover, in a highly original manner, Fortunis revisits the, the question of the relationship between determination and uh, overdetermination, sorry, and determination in the last instance, rejecting the position that in the that determination in the last instance is a kind of a, a return of some of some form of dualism and some form of economistic uh, determinism, also trying to be more uh, closer to a classical, let's say, historical materialist position, and I, in contrast. Fortunis insists that for Althusser, overdetermination is the last instance that attempts that is exactly the point, this radical conception of immanence that makes both Althusser's death to Spinoza more evident, and I believe his distance for any, from any formalistic structuralism more evident. In some, I do believe that Althusser's work has helped, has helped us a lot to understand that how uh, Althusser's self-criticism or the narrative included in Althusser's self-criticism should not be treated as an actual intellectual trajectory, but rather as a constant tension running through his work. And in line of this, in line of this and Montag's reading, Althusser's earlier work appears less a repetition of classical structuralism, but rather a very original attempt towards a thinking of social relationality in all its conflictuality contingence and openness, namely a philosophy that attempts to actually think how social transformation can emerge as a potentiality within us and uh, an always and even always original, always overdetermined conjecture. This does not mean that all of Althusser's self-criticism is to be discarded. For example, although the theory of theoretical practice offers a highly original anti-empiricist and in a certain sense anti-rationalist conception of knowledge as a materialist process of production, as the Serge was right to point, that the way that this was presented as a complete theory in Marx, almost ready-made, just to be waiting to be ext extracted by uh, means of asymptomatic reading was perhaps uh, idealist. And on this point, Althusser's sen sa sa Subsequent emphasis of how theoretical practice is a production process traversed by class struggle and a never ending, a never complete break with ideology indeed was an in important elaboration and a necessary self critical correction of this initial position. And I think that the same goes for Althusser's highly original thinking of the very notion of philosophy, not as a guarantor of truth, but as a very specific political, in the last instance, constant intervention. Here again, indeed, we can see in, in Althusser's self criticism important insights. It is in this sense that we can say that uh, if uh, uh, Warren's work is, is very important also to stress the importance of Althusser in the contemporary conjecture. About this, I mean that we can see a contemporary return uh, in the to pages, to previous pages in the history of Marxism and a constant rereading of authors in the Marxist tradition by a younger generation, which has surely enriched our knowledge of this very rich tradition. But at the same time, it's interesting to see how in certain aspects, this also tends up as a defense of classical or supposedly dialectical Marxism against post-Marxism, in the genealogy of which Althusser is often mentioned as a precursor. In this sense, bringing forward the originality of Althusser's materialist and very, very political practice of philosophy can co be considered as a still urgent task. Thank you. Thank you, Pianos. Uh, Aurelio, whenever you'd like. Hola. Hello. Hello, everybody. It's a problem. 
Muy bien. Hello. We can hear you. Hello. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. We do yeah. hear you. Do you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, everything is okay. But do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we do hear uh, you yes? very clearly. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I, as I can, I can see me on the. In the um, um, I can see me there, so there's a uh, there's a problem here, I think. Okay, so uh, hello everybody, and thanks uh, the organizers, uh, Joseph, Dylan, Larry, and of course uh, Warren. Uh, I have tried to write uh, a paper as a kind of uh, personal homage to Warren's work. Of course, I have learned from from Warren more than I can list. So I hope you, you like it. My reflection is an attempt to think around the question whether mater materialist philosophy, uh, more specifically, the materialism defended by Althusser in, uh, anti is, anti is an anti-philosophy. The question was posed by Alain Badiou, the notion of anti-philosophy comes from him in the first 90s, and initially his answer was negative. Quote, Althusser was, unlike Lacan, Foucault, or Derrida, who were all anti-philosophers, indeed the philosopher. And not only did he argue that there was philosophy, but he also proclaimed that there always would be. In essence, he upheld the philosophia perennis, unquote. But one year or so later, Badiou seems to contradict himself. In an article on Wittgenstein's anti-philosophy from 1994, he hesitates, quote, and it is very well possible that Althusser's project under the name of materialist philosophy came close close to 20th century anti-philosophy, unquote. This question brings up an old Althusserian problem, but I think new posthumous publications and new readings in a new conjunction, especially Montag's text on Althusser, set fresh light on the topic. We know uh, Althusser's answer. The materialist position in philosophy is not an anti-philosophy, Quote, philosophy will not be sub suppressed, philosophy will remain philosophy, unquote. Materialist philosophy is not an anti-philosophy, but rather a new practice of philosophy, another way of philosophizing different from the idealist way. It is still philosophy. In On Brecton Mars, for example, Althusser describes this new practice as a displacement by which one occupies in philosophy the place that represents politics. So which place represents politics in philosophy? My answer takes up Montag's reference to Masseret's Spinoza's reading of Foucault's will to knowledge, which is active in the form of power knowledge. And Juan Domingo Sanchez Stop's idea in his Althusser et Spinoza, the Tours and Retours, that Althusser apparatus of thought translates Spinoza's attribute of thought into the lexicon of historical materialism. Let us recall Foucault, Foucault's thesis quoted by Montag. Quote, there is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. My hypothesis is that the line of demarcation between materialist philosophy and anti-philosophy may perhaps be drawn between a Spinoza's reading and a Nietzschean reading of Foucault's and Althusser's power-knowledge correlation. Nietzsche, through his dismissal of the will to truth, seems to be the exemplar of the anti-philosopher for value. A Nietzschean reading of power-knowledge correlation would say that the inseparable mutual implication between power and knowledge makes the existence of truth or the true impossible. 
rendering any pursuit of objective truth futile and deceitful. On the contrary, a Spinozist reading would say that the knowledge of the mutual implication between knowledge and power is the condition of the truth. In Masseret's words, reading Foucault's, quote, to think of one's own history, that's to say, to think of oneself as belonging to a certain type of society in the conditions of an actuality is to liberate thought from what it thinks without thinking about it, and thus to open for it the way to the only freedom which can have any meaning for it, that which allows it to think differently, the expression which one could also use to illustrate the Amor Intellectualist Day of which Spinoza speaks. To think of one's history is the Foucauldian way of referring to the knowledge of the mutual implication between knowledge and power. And that this thinking allows us to think differently means, on the Spinozist reading, that it is the condition of the truth. Spinoza's name for will to knowledge is desire for understanding. And I think that this philosophy that according to Althusser persists in displacement, occupying the place that represents politics can be conceived from this concept. Cupiditas intelligendi, in Latin, may well be a translation of the Greek term philosophia, but it is above all a modification of the idealist notion of philosophy or theory as a mental activity opposed to bodily practice. By cupiditas intelligendi, the, the, activ the activity of understanding becomes social efforts and struggles, processes without subject or ends, capable of turning back on themselves. It is an understanding that knows itself as conatos, a determined power of nature. And through this knowledge, its power increases and can generate cycles of improvement, recursive increases in power, intensive and extensive cycles of liberation. Cupiditas intelligenti is inherently political because it is a power among powers. Natalia Rome calls it political desire of the truth. Striving for understanding means engaging in political struggle, struggles with and against the prevailing trends of thought that dominate society. On the other side, the very expression of philosophy's perpetual war, as well as Althusser's, uh, Althusser's stress on the fact that philosophy is not knowledge, might, might lead us to think that philosophy is no longer for Althusser a desire for understanding, or no longer has anything to do with this desire. Also, the formation in the transformation of philosophy that quotes Marx manifestly considered that to produce philosophy as philosophy was a way of entering into the adversary's game, unquote, and the phrase of a philosophy that is a non-philosophy as compared to the revolutionary state, a state that is a non-state, might incline us to think that Althusser's thought is not so far from anti-philosophy. Althusser's insistence on placing philosophy between science and ideology, or between science and, polit and politics, and his emphasis on distinguishing philosophy from science, preventing the former from being understood as the science of sciences, could possibly be interpreted as if these distinctions strip science of its political character. This insistence might allow for an interpretation that separates science and, poli and politics. On the other hand, we must consider his concept of the apparatus of thought, his view of science as production and as a historical reality. We find Althusser's ambiguity, of which we will see he was aware, between these two ex ex extremes. Althusser seems to lean towards an ide uh, idealism of science, theoreticism, or towards Nietzscheanism, pol uh, politicism. The key, it seems to me, lies in understanding that philosophy is not the index of the separation between science and politics, but of their mutually constitutive relationship. This is philosophy, the contradictory union of knowledge and politics. If we further understand this relationship under the primacy of contradiction over the contraries, 
philosophy emerges as the necessary nexus of this necessary connection. Philosophy connects the necessary relationship between science and politics. Philosophy is not a practice that could, whether exist or not, or fulfill or, or not fulfill this connecting role. It is the expression of the necessary connection between science and politics and ideology. The true or the scientific lies in the correlation between knowledge and power, which is recognized, recognized and acted upon as such. But where can we find the equivalent of the desire for understanding within Althusser's categories? I think that the equivalent, equivalent of it can be the element of the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists that stems from the experience of scientific practices itself and that Althusser calls element one. Althusser lists the thesis of this element of materialist character objectivist and confident in the scientific method. And he underlines the absence of any doubt about the cognitive power of science and of any question of right. The links between the list of thesis and Althusser's reading of Spinoza at the time are clear. Through the relationship between the two elements of the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists, Althusser exposes the political side of scientific practice. Scientific practice is always unnecessarily merged in a social struggle, a struggle for or against the exploitation of science by idealist philosophy for the benefit of other ideological practice, practices that Althusser explains as a struggle for or against the domination of element two of extra scientific idealist origin over the materialist element one. This struggle, quote, reproduce in the heart of the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists, the philosophical balance of power that exists between materialism and idealism, unquote, itself, quote, governed by other more distant forms, those of the ideological struggle and the class struggle, unquote. So the correlation between knowledge and power resides in scientific practice itself, in the form of a struggle between the philosophy that stems from that very practice, the convictions by which and in which the practice is carried out, and the philosophy that comes from other practices, ultimately from the social formation in which the practice is embedded. Compared to Spinoza's definition of desire, the spontaneous philosophy of scientists here plays the role of the idea or conscientia of the scientific practice or appetitus. To test this reading, we can move ourselves to the second half of the 70s, to the Granada's conference in 1976 on the transformation of philosophy and the posthumously published, published books, How to be Marxist in Philosophy and Philosophy for Non-Philosophers, written soon after. What is most... Sorry, What is most interesting in these works is that Althusser reclaims the idea of a philosophical force intrinsic to scientific practice. Science by itself produces materialistic effects that tear apart, subvert or endanger dominant ideology, generating a counter-offensive and idealist philosophical force that counters the materialism inherent in the desire for understanding for understanding that drives the science, the sciences. Moreover, this materialist philosophical force, when I, which I call with Spinoza the desire for understanding, precludes considering Althusser's materialism as anti-philosophy. Althusser is aware that his proposal of the perpetual war of philosophy, the orientation of philosophy towards the class struggle, can be interpreted from a Nietzschean perspective. So he will discuss what he describes in the transformation of philosophy as the negative omnipotence of philosophers, what he calls in how to be Marxist in philosophy, the idealism of the class struggle, or what he calls in philosophy for non-philosophers, subjectivism, and especially class subjectivism. All three views can be seen as features close to anti-philosophy. And in all three texts, Althusser poses the question in the form 
of a problem. In the transformation, the problem is that the most important of his exposition of the violence of philosophy as exploitation, domination, appropriation of its outside of social practices can be interpreted from Nietzsche's will to power. He opposes this anti-philosophical interpretation to a theory of philosophy as a theoretical laboratory of the constitution of the dominant ideology, which depends on Marx's investigation. It is Marx, developed by Althusser himself, who opposes Nietzsche and the Nietzscheanism of some contemporaries whom Althusser does not identify, but who could be the so-called new philosophers in the style of André Glucksmann, as the English translator observes. But this solution must not have satisfied Althusser, because he returns to it in the chapters of how to be Marxist in philosophy and philosophy for non-philosophers that take up the subject of Marxist philosophy. In How to be Marxist in Philosophy, the question is posed in line with the dual character of philosophy, quote, political, political by virtue of its function, theoretical scientific by virtue of its form, with its political function representing the essential determination of this double aspect, unquote. And it is from this dual aspect that the question arises, quote, of what use is it to philosophy to borrow the dominant forms of rationality and scientificity, unquote. That is, why is philosophy not simply political? Althusser rejects the option of a purely political philosophy, qualifying it as, quote, idealism of the class struggle. The belief that all these struggles are struggles for pleasure or prestige or simply for victory, unquote. A veiled reference, it seems to me, to Nietzsche's will to power. The first answer is like the one given in the transformation, and to serve enlarges the exploitation of science by idealist philosophy that he described in philosophy and spontaneous philosophy of the scientist to different practices. The struggle is for controlling and orienting the different practices, among them the practices of science and technology. But although this is an advance over the idealism of the class struggle, it does not solve the problem, but rather makes it more difficult because this control and orientation can well be done with, form, with forms other than that of rationality as Althusser himself recognizes one page later. The real answer, I think, is offered by Althusser in the next chapter by returning to element one of the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists in its struggle with element two. The question is that the scientific practice, quote, naturally produces a materialist critic in act to of the idealist contents of the categories and ideas under whose domination scientists work, unquote. Thus, the rationalist scientific form is what the dominant ideology must adopt in order to combat, to control, and to orient the materialist, materialist philosophical force immanent in scientific practice which subverts any non-rationalist form of ideological unification. In philosophy for non-philosophers, Althusser poses the question from the other side. He poses it not from the idealist side. The problem is not why idealist philosophy should have this scientific form, but from the side, from the side of materialist philosophy or philosophy for Marxism. That is, why a philosophy for Marxism cannot be an anti-philosophy a mere defense of power for power's sake. The first paragraph of chapter 20 states an anti-philosophical thesis in all its runs. Quote, philosophy produces not knowledge, but only a weapon in a fight. A weapon is a weapon. It produces nothing but the power of, or of victory, unquote. And then the second paragraph pushes the objection. Quote, but if this is so, does it not mean that philosophy, which depends on the ideology determinant for the dominant class, is merely an ideology? Is it not to expose oneself to the classic jives of all those who, beginning with the sophists, have mocked philosophy's pretensions to utter the truth about all things? In other words, how can we ensure that philosophy is not the theoretical delirium of an individual 
or a social class in search of guarantees or rhetorical ornament, unquote. This is a serious problem because it puts the very character of Althusser's discourse at stake. The theory of philosophy that Althusser expounds in these texts depend, depends on a given theory of society and history. What is at stake then is the scientific character of the very Marxism that Althusser draws upon. Quote, and a scientific theory of class struggle, this scientific knowledge of the ideology. Unquote. Marxism, thus understood, offers philosophy a, quote, conscious determination ensured by scientific knowledge of its conditions, forms, and laws. The correctness of the philosophy of the proletariat escapes, escapes subjectivity because it is under the control of an objective science the science of the laws of class struggle, unquote. Now, the question of the conflict between element one and element two is raised again in the science of the laws of the class struggle. Perpetual war also occurs within the, pro the proletarian side. And to serve present, presents this question first in relation to the class subjectiv subjectiv subjectivism of Lukács and his universal class on the one hand, and Stalin's economistic evolutionism on the other. He points, secondly, to the constitutive paradox of the proletarian class position in philosophy of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Gramsci, or Mao, necessary but modest, intermittent, and systematic. Since the philosophical system is an effect of the struggle for the constitution of the unity of the state, non-systematicity must be proper to the unity of a class that does not seek to exploit others. The unity of the working classes cannot be achieved through a hierarchical order, but rather through an encounter. It is not ruled by a principle of order because it can only be, returning to Montag, quote, a conjunction of singular entities in a larger situ singular entity. Unquote. The philosophy for the unity of the working classes must be as unsystematic and objective as possible. This is the paradox. The encounter of materialist philosophy must be one of an objective non-system, an aleatory encounter that knows itself to be such and acts upon it. Ultimately, materialist philosophy cannot, be, cannot simply be a perpetual war cannot be an anti-philosophy in that sense, but it must be at the same time the philosophical expression of the desire for understanding immanent in scientific and other practices. It is a perpetual rapture for understanding, an objective non-system, which is the form of emancipation of theoretical practice. Because understanding is not only a production process, but also a perpetual rupture. And the reason why idealist and materialist philosophy exist is to fight the war that this rupture provokes. In seeking its emancipation, for which it must oppose the dominant ideology, materialist theoretical practice also seeks the emancipation of all other practices. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Aurelio. Um, Bono, whenever you'd like to start. Thank you. I am so honored to be here today to celebrate Warren Montag's distinguished work, whose influence on my thinking has been nothing short of formative. I thank Lale, Dylan, and Joseph for bringing us together, for perhaps it is in these dark days of mass destruction and repression that we most need to remember that we're not alone that the work of theory has meaning, that we can keep with our striving for a different world. In this respect too, Warren Montag has done distinguished work, for our gathering today is a testament to his generosity as a scholar, boldness and creativity as a thinker, and the far-reaching resonance of his work that continues to inspire a truly global community of scholars from whom I've learned so much over the years. Okay, so let me begin. I quote, the essay submitted to you had to take the position of recognizing openly 
that struggle is at the heart of every philosophy. This quote from Althusser's Is It Simple to Be a Marxist in Philosophy opens Warren Montag's magisterial study of Althusser's philosophical thought. This study takes on the difficult task of situating Althusser's contributions in the theoretical conjunctures that he closely studied, inhabited, and took positions in, conjunctures which Althusser himself viewed as a constant battlefield of different philosophies with shifting alliances amongst them. As Montag forcefully shows, Althusser's theoretical practice was largely driven by engaging his adversaries on the field of battle, meticulously studying his contemporaries, often reading them against themselves to weaponize their own contradictions in ways that unraveled their unity and force when he did not try to enlist them toward his own purposes. To defend a rigorous Marxism against the attacks that try to dilute and discredit Marxism from within and from without, to advance in what he saw to be a philosophical war of position, Althusser was willing to forge unlikely alliances and did not fear venturing outside of Marxism into figures prior to Marx, into non and even anti-Marxist philosophies. As Montag's epigraph suggests, however, Althusser did not only struggle with adversaries in a conflictual field, but also embodied that struggle within, in fact, at the heart of his own philosophy. Um, one of the strongest merits of Montag's work is its ability to put on display how Althusser's thought interiorized the contradictions it was unable to master or resolve. It is to this internal conflictuality, Montag argues, as much as to its polemical force and incisive clarity that we owe the generative power of Althusser's thought, insofar as it invites new interventions that seek to study and examine, if not always master or resolve these contradictions. Perhaps more significant than the polemical reactions that Althusser's work has provoked then, Montag reminds us of its capacity to call forth a theoretical practice that is inspired or instigated by those latent contradictions to the elaboration and resolution of which open-ended, non-traditional, and always provisional theoretical practice, though with an unwavering commitment to materialism, continues to be directed. One of the sites in which the internal conflict of Althusser's thought is felt in a more pronounced way than ever before is undoubtedly his posthumously published text, The Underground Current of the Materialism of the Encounter. As Montag notes in chapter nine of Althusser and his contemporaries, the text's strange status as a montage and a posteriori construction by its editors, having been excerpted from a longer manuscript with countless emendations dating from different revisions, its hastily written nature with numerous errors of fact and attribution, and the lack of clarity around what it was intended to become prevents the possibility of any dissimulation of coherence and consistency that Althusser might have been give, able to give it had it been written at a different time by a different Althusser. But the fact remains that it was not, and perhaps could not have been written at a different time by a different Althusser for precisely the same reasons that prevent the closure and unity of the text. Coming at a time when Althusser had already died in his public capacity and was left in solitude to mourn the lives that he had taken, the underground current is, as Montag puts it, perhaps the philosophical analog of his autobiography, The Future Lasts Forever, a, quote, last testament or confession spoken all at once as if he were making manifest what was heretofore latent in his published oeuvre or perhaps more accurately, bringing what had been hidden into the open for all to see, Montag writes. It is in this quality as a last testament or philosophical will that I would like to approach this text as a final statement of the problems Althusser is leaving behind, of the insights he has been able to arrive at, as well as the contradictions he has not been able to settle for those affiliating themselves with his legacy to take up. In doing so, I take seriously Montag's reading of this strange dreamlike text as one marked by an unrecognized conflict at its heart. 
building on his analysis, yet also departing from it in two significant regards, I would like to attempt to delineate a central contradiction that text hosts as a sign of what late Althusser's thought has been unable either to master or to resolve and thus bequeaths as part of his philosophical estate. According to Montag, the strange text which races through the history of Western philosophy from Epicurus to Deleuze to delineate a different materialism contains two incompatible notions of the void. On the one hand, there's an ontological conception of the void expressed as le néant or le vide, indicating an originary nothingness that is the object of philosophy, or more precisely, the object of a marginal yet profound philosophical tradition that challenges dominant conceptions of origin and end, which are but the same thing. Thinking this void through the primal scene of an ancient atomism, in which atoms falling in the void stage random co co collisions caused by inexplicable swerves that lead some atoms to deviate from their otherwise vertical fall, and through the encounters of which collisions lead to the piling up of things and the emergence of the world, this materialism embraces a radical contingency. It thinks this radical contingency by remembering that always in the shadow of the world as it exists are the worlds that have not been accomplished because encounters that could have led to their accomplishment did not happen or failed to take hold worlds that have been foreclosed or lie in waiting for other encounters to undo the existing world and bring those alternatives forth. Althusser reads this philosophy of the void from Epicurus to Marx in each instance emphasizing the emptiness, nothingness, or disorder that preceded the world, whether this is the political chaos of Machiavelli's 15th century Italy, Rousseau's primeval forest, Spinoza's God, Hobbes' state of nature, or Marx's so-called primitive accumulation. This contingency of the world's beginnings due to the assumption of the void finds echoes in unexpected figures as well, in Heidegger's throneness, for example, and Wittgenstein's radical nominalism that builds the world out of the case. Against the ontological conception of the void, Montag asserts, there is another conception that is at fundamental odds with it, one for which the void is not an object of contemplation, but one that makes the void a philosophical performative. In this conception, discoursing on the void is a way to make room for different theoretical arguments. Montag points us to those places in Althusser's text in which he references a triumvirate. Nietzsche, Deleuze, and Derrida as philosophers who could, I quote, give up thinking the origin as reason or end in order to think it as nothingness, end of quote. Montag elevates Deleuze to centrality in this triumvirate as a fellow Spinozist whose reflections on the void emphasize not the originary nothingness, but instead how the void in Lucretius came to signify the irreducible diversity and singularity that nature produces against the pl Platonist emphasis on identity. In Montag's interpretation then, Deleuze's inscription of the swerve as a kind of conatus of the atom works to emphasize the continuous production of singularities and becoming against the static and totalizing platonic being. Montag considers this more consistently Spinozist reading of Epicurus and Lucretius to undercut Althusser's ontological conception of the void, where the void now, under, and I quote from Montag, understood as a verb, an activity rather than a substance, even if that substance is a negation of substance, end of quote, references the in, infinite diversity of the world that Althusser had tried to capture in his earlier writings. Indeed, reading the underground current, one is confronted with the difficulty of deciding the status of the primal scene of the reign of atoms in the void, in which, which Althusser borrows from Epicurus and to which he recurs when discussing different thinkers, as if they warrant being placed in the tradition Althusser is constructing 
precisely because they are later examples of the same, or as Montag puts it, a series of variations on a single theme. Indeed, part of the enigma and perhaps paradoxical appeal of the text among Althusser's readers can be attributed to the undecidability of this primal scene. Is it the statement of an ontological condition, much like the one often attributed to the state of nature in Hobbes, that functions in the theory as an existential basis that will justify the validity of the otherwise highly debatable propositions to come? Is it a contingent historical starting point for a materialist tendency in philosophy to which later thinkers subscribing to that tendency were obliged to allude to without substantial commitment to the atomistic materialism? Alternatively, is it an elusive metaphor for a political logic that Althusser has long expressed in, myriad, in a myriad of different formulations and restatements about the necessity to think beyond a teleological narrative? Montag's reading, which I have reconstructed with great brevity and thus definitely not doing justice to its richness or complexity, offers us an incredibly insightful and clarifying way of approaching Althusser's text as one that is at war with itself, expressed in the opposing conceptions of the void that he suggestively reconstructs. However, I would like to raise questions about and take issue with two aspects of this reading. First, I wonder if the Deleuze-inspired conception of the void, which Montag powerfully theorizes, can really constitute a viable materialist alternative. At the expense of alienating all the Deleuzeans among you, I must say that I'm not entirely convinced that the Deleuzean conception of the void is free of the problems associated with the ontological one in which the void is the object of philosophy. Deleuze is no doubt important for Althusser, first as one of his contemporaries whose critique of structuralism pushed Althusser to clarify his own relation to it, and as Montag puts it in chapter five, to finally separate himself from the metaphysical notion of structure that had permeated his work prior to 1967-68. Deleuze was also important for taking up Epicurus via Lucretius much earlier than Althusser did, uh, as early as 1961, I believe. As thinkers, he endowed with a significant role for the counter canon in Western philosophy that he positioned against Platonism. In fact, Lucretius constituted a continuous point of reference for Deleuze, one that he later, later situated at the head of a refashioned canon of empiricists. Deleuze wrote, and I quote, I see a secret link between Lucretius, Hume, Spinoza, and Nietzsche, constituted by their critique of negativity, their cultivation of joy, their hatred of interiority, the externality of forces and relations, the denunciation of power, and so on." End of quote. In this latter capacity of the maker of an alternative canon of minor philosophers, based on their distinctive conceptual contributions that challenged the major canon, I would argue, Deleuze was not only an inspiration, but also a rival for Althusser. And the underground current can be read as a delayed attempt to bring to fruition a goal that Althusser may have inadvertently pursued in his philosophical excursions into a whole range of figures, ranging from Montesquieu to Machiavelli, Lenin to Rousseau, and Lucretius to Marx, reading them against the grain, as it were, as part of the philosophical battles he was waging, without ever acknowledging that part of his project might have been to construct an alternative materialist canon, a counter canon, as it were, all along. But more to the point, Deleuze's analysis of the significance of Epicurus Lucretius is tied to his critique of Platonism, a task he assumed following Nietzsche's own goal and injunction to reverse Platonism as the task of the philosophy of the future. Deleuze's reading of Epicurus through Lucretius counteracts the Platonic being through becoming. Instead of the principle of identity, it presents differences and resemblances. Instead of the is, it gives the conjunction of singularities, the and. It thus accounts for the diversity in nature that cannot be totalized into a single whole. Deleuze writes, nature is Harlequin's cloak made entirely of solid patches and empty spaces, 
She is made of plenitude and void, beings and non-beings, with each one of the two posing itself as unlimited while limiting the other. Being an addition of indivisibles, sometimes similar and sometimes different, nature, capital N, is indeed a sum, but not a whole, end of quote. Likening nature to a harlequin's cloak, Deleuze point posits the Lucretian gesture to be against all those philosophies that espouse being, the one, and the whole, which he condemns as the theological forms of a false philosophy. The atomic basis of Epicurean philosophy is not unimportant for Deleuze insofar as atoms are infinite, but untotalizable. By inscribing the clinamen, which is the source of atomic collisions, to the movement of atoms itself, as a difference in the direction of the velocity of each atom, rather than treating it as a contingent deviation from the vertical fall, Deleuze offers an alternative ontology that embraces the atomic conatus as a differential of matter, which confirms the irreducible plurality of causes or of causal series and the impossibility of bringing causes together into a whole. With Deleuze then, we are drawn into a battle that takes place on the basis of the nature of the atom and its movement. While Deleuze's reading refuses platonic being, thereby undoing the unity of the void, it substitutes in its place a different ontology based on becoming, with nature as the patchwork of plenitude and emptiness. Thus, the truth or falsity of the propositions that he advances can only be assumed to rise or fall on the basis of his metaphysics of naturalism whose affirmation of multiplicity is upheld for its possibility to demystify fears and illusions. Thus, we find ourselves in an ancient complot in which two tendencies confront each other, becoming against being, multiplicity against unity, some against the whole, patches of plenitude and void against only the void. Indeed, Deleuze and Althusser converge almost indistinguishably in their approach to Epicurus. If by Althusser's interest in Epicurus, we are to take away an ontology alternative to that of Plato. However, I wanna ask, how might we square such an espousal that appears to be simply the inverted version of idealism's ontological claims with Althusser's search for a different materialism that breaks free of idealist residues? What room is there in this alternative ontology for either historical contingency or political indeterminacy, for overdetermination or underdetermination? It is perhaps this residual idealism in aleatory materialism in the form of a negative ontology, despite all the gestures of disavowal that are scattered in Althusser's text, of idealism and idealist materialisms alike that informs the barely disguised dissatisfaction that I detect in Montag's approach to the late Althusser. I may be wrong. My second point of divergence from Montag's reading then follows from the problems with the Deleuzian alternative of the void to identify a contradiction that cuts deeper than the void and imbues the kind of materialism of which the void is part. The unevenness or conflictuality in the underground current, I will venture to suggest, permeates the whole text in the form of what we can formulate as two materialist tendencies, at times intermingled with one another or converging, albeit asymptotically, and at times disjunct and or patently opposed. These two tendencies united in an uneasy combination under the title of aleatory materialism or the materialism of the encounter are, I contend, on the one hand, an atomistic materialism understood as an ontology for Marxism derived from the ancient philosophy of Epicurus and has proven to be timeless in a way that could be suitable for Marxism's renewal and regeneration. And on the other hand, a counter hegemonic or contrarian materialism that is defined less in reference to a set of core theses about the nature of matter than as a position taken within the conflictual field of philosophy in opposition to the dominant position, which in however muted and mediated form 
often functions as the position that strengthens the ruling classes. Accordingly, this contrarian materialism has little to do with atomism as such, but much to do with the function of atomism in the Kampf plots of antiquity. In this latter sense, once again, Althusser's convergence with the Deleuzian reading, which positions atomism against the Platonic position, is easily justifiable. However, what this rapprochement occludes is a fundamental and perhaps irreconcilable difference, namely, that for the counter-hegemonic position to be a materialist one, rather than simply a subversive or transgressive one in the Kampf plot, it is necessary that it also correspond to a position that represents, in however muted form, the politics or the voice of the oppressed. In Deleuze, such a consideration, at least with respect to Epicurus, seems to me to be absent, and not coincident coincidentally, he sees the axis of confrontation not between idealism and materialism, but between idealism and naturalism, or later, empiricism. By contrast, the distinguishing feature of Althusser's text, especially when it's referencing other thinkers, such as Machiavelli and Marx, and to a lesser extent, Hobbes and Rousseau in the underground current, is that the references to the atoms become much more of a metaphor and a loose one at that, rather than or alongside a metaphysics. Those moments of the text, admittedly confused and oscillating and not particularly self-reflexive, reveal a concern that has animated Althusser's approach to the history of philosophy since the early 1970s. I have in mind the considerations that drive Lenin and philosophy, for example, in the form of the conceptualization of materialism as class struggle in the field of theory. In other words, these thinkers were materialists not because of a timeless commitment to atomism, but insofar as they opposed the dominant ideology articulated in the historically different forms of their respective ba battlefields. Let us recall Althusser's assertion from another strange unpublished manuscript predating the underground current by only a few years, Philosophy for Non-Philosophers, where he writes, I quote, idealism talks about truth, but behind truth, it is power that appears on the horizon and with power, order, end of quote. It is an Epicurus's ability to emphasize the beginning of the world, to start with the existence of matter rather than question the origin of the world, that Althusser finds the class position that helps, I quote, eliminate meaningless questions, not just the question of the origin of the world, but also everything connected with it, the question of God, of his omnipotence, of his incomprehensibility, of time and eternity, and so on, end of quote. Eliminating or at least circumventing questions of origin and being then, or critiquing religion as the ideology that justifies the existing order benefiting dominant classes is the first task of a materialism worthy of its name. Perhaps Althusser's very indecision between the labels of aleatory materialism as more or less capturing ontological contingency and the materialism of the encounter as an expression that could refer to the encounter of atoms as much as it could refer to the encounter of antagonistic tendencies, representing in displaced form the clash of antagonistic classes, as two interchangeable labels of what is purportedly the same materialism, is itself the best evidence to the presence of this unresolved con contradiction that runs through the text, pulling it in two opposing directions that are barely held together by the elusive and recurrent references to atoms falling in the void. This contradiction has important repercussions for what Althusser problematized as the interpretation of Marxist philosophy in terms of gnosiology and ontology by a good number of contemporary Soviet philosophers and their Western emulators, end of quote. As Althusser once put it, in how to be a Marxist in philosophy. But it is also relevant for contemporary forms of materialism, new materialisms, with their posthumous and vitalist variations that are deeply inflected by an ontological turn, which builds on a revised conception of matter informed by quantum physics and the decentering 
or dismantling of anthropocentrism, which of course is very different from Althusser's critique of humanism. Montag's reading of the late Althusser then opens a path that takes us following in the footsteps of his unresolved, perhaps unresolvable contradictions, not only toward Althusser's contemporaries, but also toward our own complex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, okay, so I think we'll take a 10 minute break, um, if that's okay. And um, we'll be back at, that would be 3.42.